not. Um, so quickly, uh, I'll jump back into it because we are pressed for time and uh, there's a lot I want to cover. Um, so this is a, the example of the Local Market Insight Report for this subdivision in South Riding, Virginia. Uh, the difference is the admin role, uh, you aren't able to see my branding here, but your branding will show up if you go, if you're logged in and you uh, open up the Local Market Insight Report, you'll see your contact information up top. Uh, just some nice infographics to see how listing activity and sales activity compares to last month and the same month last year, as well as the year-to-date totals for a variety of different metrics. Once you get into the home type specific uh, page, so this is just for townhouses, I get a, a narrative as well. So feel free to take that narrative, you know, copy and paste it. You guys are, are the customers, so uh, take it and, and do what you'd like with it. Um, but it's a nice way to sort of summarize uh, some of the key metrics, key indicators for your area. Um, the other reports are the detailed reports. These were carried over. There was always a monthly report at MRS. We've added, extended that to also have year-to-date, quarterly, and yearly reports, especially in a lower volume area like a subdivision or a uh, low volume uh, zip code. Year-to-date reports are definitely they definitely come in handy. Basically, you get all. This is comparing all of January through November of this year versus January of January through November of last year, and just. It's not the prettiest report, but there's a lot of information that you can use. Okay, so those are the report section. That's the best. That's your best bet if you're in a rush and you just want to have something, you know, to look over with your clients. Just print these out and take them with you. Um, the next section is the dashboard. Um, so the dashboard is sort of a high-level view of the key metrics in a given area. Uh, I'll go ahead and toggle this out a little further to let's just go to Northern Virginia. So again, all of these are being updated now for all the counties that are encompassed by Northern Virginia. So these, these are a quick way of seeing uh, how the most recent month's uh, stats compare to the five-year average for that month. Because of the seasonality of the market, you always want to compare this month versus that same month in years past. And I'll get into the seasonality in a bit. But basically, where this color breaks on each chart, that's the five-year average. That indicates where the five-year average is. The dial is the most recent month. So if that dial is below this color break, then you know that we're that your area is actually below the five-year month, five-year November average um, in sales in this instance. New pending activity, it's above the five-year uh, November average. Months of supply, it's still very low, but uh, it is. 3.2 months in Northern Virginia. Um, the control panel, so I can see that more. Um, so you can, the arrows aren't all that obvious, but you can continue to uh, go through all of these by hitting the arrow. You'll see sale price information, list price for actives, days on market. Days on market have been rising of late uh, compared to last year. Um, and any of these can be embedded. I'll hit on the embedding at the end when we go through the interactive charts, but if you click embed, uh, select your the metric that you'd like to embed on your website, uh, update automatically. That This means that every month every month going forward when RBI gets new information in smart charts, your website will be updated with that, so it's a set it and forget it type of thing. Keep current date is more if you're blogging and you have narrative around whatever you've embedded and you don't want it to update moving forward, otherwise the narrative would be um, would not make sense uh, if somebody's looking at your archives. So those are the market gauges, a great way to see, you know, if you're hearing terrible stories about, oh, or sales are down versus last year, or pending activities down versus last year, you know, it's important to keep in mind last year may have been an anomaly or might have been the high water mark, but we're still ahead of five-year averages in a lot of cases, in a lot of metrics, in a lot of locations. So pay attention to those metrics and those gauges. Um, the spotlight, uh, pretty straightforward. YOY, it just means year over year. So November of this year versus November last year, dollar volume's up 0.3%. MOM means month over month. So that means for closed sales, for instance, uh, sales in November were down 19.4% versus last month. Try to stay away from the month over month changes because of the seasonality of the market. It really, unless you're looking at 
five year or ten year average average change for a given month versus month, year over year really is the better uh, it's, it's the indicator to look at when you're talking about uh, market trends. Uh, the contract snapshot uh, pretty straightforward. The explore section is new in smart charts. We added this. Uh, this was not at all available in RV uh, in our legacy product. Um, so basically, this gives me the opportunity to explore all the counties within a given region, uh, for example. Uh, and I can change the, the metrics that are being plotted. So median sold price is the default, but I can also compare median days on market for all the counties within Northern Virginia. Uh, let's say that I go to Fairfax County. Oh, and just, I missed it, but you can also see all zip codes within the region. Um, basically, all the children locations of a, a larger location. So in Fairfax County, the default is to show the median sold price for all cities within Fairfax County. So as I scroll down, I can see, I can uh, change to sort by year to date or by monthly. I can export any of these uh, to uh, Excel and, and take it, save it, do what I want to do with it uh, afterwards. I do a lot of that when I'm writing uh, market reports, is just exporting this list to Excel and, and taking it further from there. Like I can also change this to show all zip codes within Fairfax County and all the way down to legal subdivisions within Fairfax County. Uh, the list is going to be very long and there's a lot, several a good portion that might not have any sales on a monthly basis, but I can see the year-to-date um, trends. If I switch this to sold listings, I can see which subdivisions within Fairfax County year-to-date are, uh, <clears throat> are performing well. Obviously, this is the year-over-year -year change. Um, so that's a great section if you want to dive in to see where your particular subdivision or zip code is ranked versus its neighbors. then that's a great place to start and help give context to uh, conversations you're having with clients. Uh, the charts section, just make sure I didn't miss any questions. Okay, good. Charts is really the, the meat and potatoes of, of smart charts. Um, this is where you can dive as, as deep as you'd like, or you can stay at, at a, a high level. Um, so, oh shoot, sorry, I had a little snag there. My machine was acting up. Um, so the default is going to be for Fairfax County, uh, Virginia is just a 12 month view of the most recent, um, a 12 month view of closed sales, but there's a lot more within this application to, uh, explore. Uh, you can see actual values or change from your change from previous year. So here we can see that sales have been down pretty consistently in Fairfax County for the last several months. Like I said, last year was a uh, particularly strong year um, in terms of sales. Uh, I can also, if I go back to I, I tend to go with Northern Virginia when I'm doing these demos, but I've been asked to maybe check out a different location that might not be as much in my comfort zone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go into Charles County uh, just to give some examples of how the interactive charts can be used. So you have the option of either plotting multiple metrics or multiple facets, and I'll get into that a little bit here. Um, for example, if I want to compare multiple metrics in Charles County, Maryland, I can uh, simply click Add Metrics. So let's go to the Pricing Trends uh, metric grouping. So the median sold price is the default, and I can see the last 12 months. Um, I'm having machine issues. These scrolls shouldn't be there. Um, at go to meeting just really messes with my machine, so. Please ignore these. These won't be showing up on your, your screen. Um, 
So median sold price is the default, but then I can turn on additional metrics to see uh, other views of uh, listings, such as the median list price for sales. That's just basically uh, the list price is the time, at time of contract, the sold price is at time of sale. Um, so we can turn, actually turn that one off. Uh, the other metric would be median list price for new pendings. So this is, this is in the most recent months, homes that went to contract, what was the, um, what was the list price at time of, of, that the contract was signed? So you can see that the contract price is often higher than the median sold price, uh, which is where things that may have gone to pending in September, some of them may have gone to sale in um, October, some of them in November, but the most recent month's activity in terms of contract activity, that's your new pendings uh, view. I'm going to turn off median list price for sales because that doesn't really help us in this example. Uh, I can also turn on the median list price for active list listings. So we can see that in Charles County, the active inventory is way higher priced than what's actually going to contract and what's actually selling the plate. Um, so that may have something to do with just uh, excess inventory on the high end that isn't as in demand. But it also, you can dive in to one uh, characteristic at a time when you have multiple metrics shown. I can see what this looks like for, let's say that I'm uh, representing a list listing that is 2,500 to, or 2,000 to 2,500 square feet. So here we can see that the, the money line really for what's selling lately is 275. The active inventory right now is at 309, oh, $310,000. So if I'm having a conver uh, conversation with my lister about, you know, what's the, what might be the sweet spot uh, and I've gone through the CMA, et cetera, this can help make the case that, look, you know, you, your competition's here. You can go a bit lower to what's more realistic lately, or, you know, this is what's selling. But having this view of what's active versus what's actually selling is a, a, is a good conversation to have with your uh, lister. Um, so that's an example of multiple metrics being shown in one facet. I can change this to, you know, basically look at just townhouses, for example, and see just how pricey some of the active market is for townhouses. Any metric, any single metric can be shown there. Once I change this back to uh, only show one metric, you'll see what happens to my facet bar. Uh, if I show just median sold price, now this is turned back into a pick list. From here, from here I'll be able to uh, chart multiple facets at, at the same time. So let's say we're just looking at, let's look at supply and demand in Charles County. And so the months of supply. So this is basically, if no new homes, months of supply means if based on the number of active listings headed into the month, the number of months it would take, if no new listings were added to the inventory, how long it would take for all active inventory to sell out in that theoretical or hypothetical space how long it would take all homes to sell based off of the last 12 month sales pace. So generally four to six months is considered a balanced market. Uh, anything lower than four months is generally considered a buyer, a seller's market, excuse me. And anything above six months, you're really getting into um, sellers, uh, buyers market territory where the advantage is more in sellers and you're going to see homes take longer to sell, et cetera. Um, so this right now, because I had townhouses turned on, uh, I can see that townhouses here are, it's very much a seller's market in this county. Uh, I can switch that or turn on to see how that compares to all home types. And we can see that all home types are really more in that balanced uh, range of six months of supply. So townhouses, if I'm, if I'm an agent in Charles County, I, you know, I'd target townhouses uh, just based off of this, but I'd obviously dive a little further in. But townhouses, it's a good place to be a seller uh, if you are selling townhouses there. Um, another example of this, let's say that you are uh, trying to figure out what the sweet spot is in terms of list price ranges. Um, what I'd do if I'm 
so I have multiple metrics that I can turn on, multiple facets that I can turn on here. Um, this is basically all listings based on uh, price ranges. So I, let's say, I, I change this to instead of one year, I just turn on three months because I know I'm going to plot multiple series. This nav bar is killing me. I've never seen that before. Um, but at any rate, uh, so for all home types, like we showed in the previous view, it's 5.8 months of supply. But let's turn on multiple list price ranges to see if there's a particular market that is um, that supply is way down relative to demand. So as I'm turning these on, this serves as my legend. So I can see in Charles County, this is the uh, number of months full of supply for all homes. But I can see in these lower price ranges, demand is exceedingly high relative to supply. So this might be a chart that I'd take to, you know, uh, less costly, uh, more affordable homes, uh, more affordable neighborhoods to help make the case, hey, you know, if I'm farming, this might be an area that I focus on in Charles County. Um, I can see that as homes get more expensive, they're getting more towards buyer's markets. There's less, less demand relative to supply there. Um, while I have all of these facets turned on, I have the option to, you can see ad metrics has been turned off because I have multiple, so I can only show one. I can change uh, what this, I can change the metric within the metric category, or I can look at, so I know that you know, this is the months of supply, but what if that just means there's like three homes, active homes in this 150 to 200K price range? Well, I can switch this to look at the market activity. My facets stay turned on. I'll turn off all. And I can see that, you know, there are, there were 31 sales in that, um, in that particular price range. But there are a decent amount of active listings. I don't know. I mean, it's not the majority. The majority really is in this 200 to 300K range. But that, that by being able to switch between metrics, I can focus in on a particular price range or price ranges and not lose um, my previous view. Um, the last sort of technical piece of, of the application, and you don't have to memorize the one means I can't do multiple there, et cetera. It, the, the application will work in, in that way, so it's, there's not much of a learning curve there. Um, but let's say that I turn on you can see the compare locations is turned off when I have that view, when I have multiple facets or multiple metrics. But let's say that I just want to focus on this 300 to 400K list price range. Um, again, here I'm looking at active listings. Let's, I'll toggle back to that months of supply, which I think is the most important metric that we have um, because it really is the view of supply and demand. So in this 300 to 400K range, or actually let's do the 200 to 300 K range. 5.1 months of supply in Charles County. I can then compare locations. Let's say I want to dig into Waldorf, Maryland, which is a city within Charles County, and see how Waldorf compares to Charles County. Note that the facets options have now changed to a select box, so I can't compare multiple facets there. But I can dive further into Waldorf by, let's say that I, that's my main territory. I cover most of these zips, and I want to be able to tell a story about um, which zip is the hottest, uh, for instance. So I can just turn those on, and now these are serving as my legend. So from this, I can tell that 20603 is the closest to a seller's market for this type, this price range, which I know from my previous chart, that's where most of the listings sit. So I might, you know, from a business sense, I might make sense to focus on 20603, you know, target those, those locate, that zip code in particular, because, you know, there's a, a an even greater demand for fast success, uh, listings moving quicker in that uh, money range. Uh, I can, toggle this back, even though I have multiple locations turned on and I have my price range facet turned on, I can toggle this back to look at, say, days on market, 
you know, pull up the median days on market. I can switch this to average. And I can see that, see how that months of supply really correlates with days on market being lower. Remember, well, 20603 was the lowest months of supply for this price range in the area, and that corresponds to homes moving faster uh, relative to neighboring areas. So those that's sort of a, a quick view, or a, try to be quick, uh, view of, of the different features around how to interact with the charts to get as much information as you, you can. Uh, focus on a given metric that you feel most comfortable with. Obviously, you know, it'd be great to master all of the different metrics that we have. Um, but, you know, your sellers, you're just trying to, A, establish your brand as the local market expert. So, you know, if you don't want to get into what is uh, median days to settle and, and things um, that are more granular, you know, focus on days on market, focus on median sold price, and focus on market activity. Um, another way to sort of establish your brand, it's kind of a good conversation piece to help show that you are paying attention to the market, you are the market expert, um, is to talk about, you know, just the base market basics near you. Uh, so if we switch this out to Northern Virginia, you can see as I change locations, everything that I have turned on remains turned on. I'll go ahead and remove these guys start over but basically once I change locations everything that I have top turned on uh, remains in play uh, which saves you lots of clicks um, the the markers down at the bottom the sorry these options down at the bottom so I have the option of viewing you know as, as few as one month but I can also go back 10 years and this 10 year view does a few does a few things um, it it allows me to show yeah inventory has been up of late compared to last year but we're still nowhere near where we were in the dark times um, I can show these are showing the actual values but I also have the option of changing from of the percent change from previous year and that's an even more uh, crazy a view of what happened back when inventory just shot up and nobody was selling. So yeah, we've had year-over-year -year increases in inventory and they've been high compared to last year. Again, this is just the percent change. So you know, for I don't know why this thing is showing the scroll. Um, Thirty-seven and a half percent up, but we're still not in that you know crazy market. Uh, Last year, two years ago, we were talking about how low inventory was. So it's more of a normalization of the market in a lot of our uh, regions. Um, I can switch this to show how new listing activity changed over the years. And you can see back in the hard times, listing activity shot up while I can add metrics and show new pending activity dropped off. So the green is when listings just increased double-digit uh, percentages consistently, while at the same time, new pending activity back in 2005, 2004, 2005, people stopped buying, everybody started selling, and that's why you saw that inventory change. Um, not that this is something that you necessarily share um, with a, a client, but it's good to have that 10-year view to, sign, to kind of see where the current market stands, so it's not just a well. In the last two months, something something spiked up a bit, um, so the sky is falling. Um, make sure that you have a view of of hit the history of inventory, especially because that is a huge impact on market activity. Um, another, so I'm going to switch this back. So this is still changed from previous year. Oh, and another point to make, um, so I'll switch this to pricing trends now and just look at median sold price, and this is the year-over-year -year change, and you can see how, see what happened after that inventory built up uh, in that previous chart. Well, that's when prices really started tanking in, in this particular location. Uh, but we can see they've flattened out some, but you know we wouldn't want to see these kinds of uh, increases uh, leading to a bubble, so that's okay. Um, 
the, this is the change from previous year view. I'm going to switch back to actual values. So at this, an important takeaway from this is the seasonality of the market. It doesn't just impact the number of listings that are available. Um, if I switch back to market activity and I look at uh, new pending activity, it not only changes the number of homes that are changing hands, you know, there are fewer homes sold in, in the uh, winter. Obviously, we're all, we all know about that seasonal impact. Um, there's fewer listings to choose from, um, but this, these peaks, you know, winter, spring, winter, spring, these are important things. Having this objective view of what the, the market actually does throughout the year is a good way of, you know, I've actually used them. I'm not a realtor, but, you know, I, had, I have friends that uh, are were looking to sell. Guy was looking to move, and I, I, just changed, I actually pulled up on my iPad uh, this chart. It showed the median sold price ch uh, changes. There's seasonality, not just in market activity, but in how much uh, homes are going for. So this is the median sold price. Switch this to median list price for new pendings. Actually, we can compare the two, and you can see how new pendings uh, prices are a leading indicator of what's going to sell in the following months. So this is the line view of it. So this is the median sold price for closed sales. This is the median list price for new pendings. And you can see that the yellow line here, these are things that went to contract. And you can see how they're ahead of the closed sales price uh, almost every month. So they're a leading indicator. So we might report on median sold price, but it doesn't always, um, because it's a little challenging because not all pendings will and ultimately close. but. If you pay attention to that median list price for new pendings, um, you'll know the direction that's probably going to be reported in the following months. Um, but if you look at the trends for the median list price for new pendings and the seasonality of that, what I actually did was <clears throat> use the export to Excel. Uh, I did uh, some work with Washingtonian Magazine that they wanted to talk about seasonality, not saying that you'd want to dive in this deep, but I took the 10-year average, monthly averages over the last 10 years for the different months and, and found that December is definitely the time to be a buyer if you're concerned about if price is your main concern. Uh, homes that went to contract in December over the last 10 years were 6% lower than the uh, monthly average across all months. Uh, Conversely, May, you know, you can see in most months, May is the peak. May is the time when buyers or sellers are getting the most for their listings and that the average price in May in, in the D.C. metro area uh, was actually 7% higher than the monthly average across all months. The difference between December, you know, here, most months, December and May in terms of price was 13%. So there's a 13% gap. So that's very important information. Not that you have to memorize that 13% or, or run the, the analysis uh, from here, but that's really an important thing to share with folks as they're making decisions on whether to buy or sell or people saying, I'm waiting until there's more listings available. If you can find the right listing in the, in the off season, um, you know, you might have better luck since they'll, they'll be more willing to negotiate on price. Um, days on market, obviously, is going to follow that seasonal path as well. So that 10-year view, especially when you go up to a higher level where you can see trends because there's more volume, like a region level or even a county level, um, having that 10-year view is a good conversation to have with your uh, potential clients. Um, how else can we use the charts? Uh, during pricing discussions, I'm going to flip back to, actually I'm going to open up Chrome to see if maybe this, um, bear with me, my, get some more charts and come. I just want to give a few other 
real world examples of, of how to use uh, the interactive charts. Some might be too much, some you might not be comfortable with yet, but when you're having uh, discussions with uh, customers, I'll just leave it at the mid-Atlantic uh, highest level. Uh, these trends are pretty true throughout. Um, if I want to show average sold price to original list price ratio, this is basically telling me 94.4%. Actually, I do want to get into a little a bit more granular region. This is plotting the average SP to OLP ratio over the last 12 months. I can go back 10 years and see how it's changed. You can see the seasonality there. Uh, but let's say I just turned it on for three months. The average SP to OLP ratio is 96% in November. It tends to go down, obviously, in the winter, uh, fall and winter months. I can plot this against days on market ranges. So basically, this days on market facet, it buckets those listings that sold in zero days. Basically, they were sold same day as they went on market. They had contracts, 1 to 10 days, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and those homes that took a long, much longer time to sell. Um, so I, if I turn this these on, we can see the impact of time on market, the impact that that will have on your uh, sold price. So homes that are selling very quickly, 1 to 10 days, 99.8%. But as you go further down, homes that are on the market, say, you know, 1 to 2 months, 95.5%. 61 to 90 months drops down further and further. Um, this is particularly um, apparent in certain counties versus others. If you're in a lower uh, lower demand area, then that days on market doesn't have as big of an impact. But uh, you know, pull this type of chart. It's basically just go to pricing ratios, average SP to OLP, and then turn on your facets. And this is a great way to have if you have done your CMA and you're with a buyer that or a seller that's overly ambitious on price, but he also wants to move quickly, et cetera. This is a great objective view of the impact of overpricing your home. Um, so we recommend you use that regularly. <clears throat> Another aspect of the charts that I'll show is uh, we're, there's bank mediated information. Uh, bank mediated is just a, for some reason, it's a nicer, less negative connotation of uh, distressed properties. Uh, so I can go back to, let's just look at over the last three years. This is number of sale. I'm going to switch to number of sales. And I can see uh, closed sales of all types for the last three years. I can turn on bank mediated and show foreclosures REL only. Let's see if REO, so these are bank-owned homes. And I can see that in Northern Virginia, REO really is of minimal impact. Uh, short sales, a little more so, but when you compare it to non-bank mediated, so these are standard sales, you can see that they're just dwarfed by healthy, standard, regular, regular old sales. Now that's in Northern Virginia, and, and, and we're seeing that trend in most counties in Virginia. Um, Maryland had a different process. They had a more litigious uh, process of getting the REOs. You know, basically, banks had to go through several years in a lot of cases to um, basically take the, R the homes from the uh, previous owners, which you know, was nice, a nice thought at the time. But what happened in Maryland is it, it protracted some of the uh, foreclosures getting off the books. So when I switch this to the Baltimore metro area, you can see that it's still not a huge amount, but it's definitely, uh, we're starting to see more foreclosures uh, creep up. Uh, this is looking at sales. If I look at change from previous year, we can see there's been several months, almost two years of consistent, year and a half of consistent REO growth. Um, that it's still not at the level that it's of a huge concern, but that is part of the reason why Baltimore area prices are um, flat. 
you know, there hasn't been a huge increase. It's still a, a relatively healthy market, but these foreclosures can impact prices, not just of foreclosures, but of non-foreclosures. Uh, another view of this, of, of the impact that foreclosures can have, sorry, this, I don't know how long that had been blinking, um, is to just switch this and look at the pricing trends for, uh, this is the median sold price for foreclosures is less than $100,000. Uh, Non-bank median, so standard sales, we can see it's $260,000. So if you're, you know, representing a buyer looking for bargains, especially in Baltimore City, but, you know, doesn't mind fixer offers, et cetera, then this is a chart to show, yeah, there is, there's definitely a, a difference in pricing there. Um, another view of how uh, distressed properties can play into a, a given market, and this is the last thing I'll have time for, is under the supply and demand uh, metric, so months of supply for, for, for short sales, it's relatively high, but uh, I'll switch this instead to um, seller success rate. So actually I'll start with all to have a more dramatic uh, thing. Um, the seller success rate, so this is of all pendings that left pending status, they could either fail or they could sell or they stayed in pending status. We're only talking about those that left pending status that were in pending status. 81% of contracts succeeded uh, uh, for all home types in Baltimore Metro. However, when we turn on short sales, we can see that only 40% of contracts on short sales succeeded. This, you know, if I was an agent, I'd look at that and say, I'm not going anywhere near short sales. Um, another view of that is in the days on market. So the median DOM, it's not that much different, uh, but we've added another metric, which is days to settle. So this is the amount of time between um, the time the contract was written and when the success, this sale actually went through, the settlement happened. And so now we can look at the difference between short sales and all home types. So for normal home or all homes, the average days to settle is 121 days in, in Baltimore Metro. That's actually higher than I would have expected. Oh, that's the average days to settle, I'm sorry. The median day, oh, that, I'm sorry, I just confused myself. Contract to settle was the one that we're talking about. So the median day, the days to settle is time from listing originally to settlement. Contract to settle is the time from contract to settlement. I apologize about that. But here we can see that the time to settle for short sales, the average time during contract is 122 days. For those that actually, the 40% that actually end up successfully closing, they're sitting on the market a very, very long time. They're just sitting in contract a very long time versus your standard 30 to 45 days for standard sales. Um, that, I know I'm up against the uh, time limit. I'm going to go ahead and go long. If you're still with me, feel free to stay with me. I, I'm going to get into embedding in a second. I apologize for running long. We lost some time there when uh, GoToMeeting wasn't cooperating with me. Let me see if there are any questions. Okay, I have a request. So. Let's see, can you look up the PG County foreclosures, please? Yes, I can do that real quick. Um, let me switch out of this metric, actually. So this is contract to settle. Actually, I'll just show you, it's pretty consistent. It's not just in Baltimore Metro that things sit in pending status forever when they're short sales. Um, so I'll switch to Prince George's County, and you'll see same pattern, 147 days versus standard sales, uh, moving through contract more quickly, but the question was about foreclosures and market activity. So foreclosure sales in Prince George's County, uh, it's still not, if you compare foreclosures versus all home types, it, mm, it's, it's not a huge deal, but it is a higher proportion than you'd see in um, a lot of Virginia counties. Uh, new listings, let's see, just for foreclosures, let's see how, if more are hitting the market lately, and I'll do change from previous year. So here we can see there was year-over-year -year decreases in 
new listings of uh, foreclosures. They've since begun to increase. Um, this doesn't mean more folks are losing their homes to the banks than last year. It, what this is really showing is that banks have gotten through that litigation process and are have ownership of the and are releasing it to the market. So I don't want you to read this as saying more folks are in the active foreclosure process. I um, hope that makes sense. Another question is, yes, uh, I recorded it. Uh, I'm hoping to post this recording, although <laughs> there are a lot of uh, kinks in it. I'll try to uh, have it posted on YouTube. Um, by tomorrow, there's some processing time that has to happen. Uh, if you want to watch it basically on demand, you can go to Smart Charts and then Support. And on the Support page, there is a training tab. So I know this is a lot of steps, but basically on that training page, there's places to sign up for the next webinar but there's also uh, YouTube embeds of, uh, of these uh, webinars. So you can go there um, to watch it on demand. Uh, no problem. Embedding, if you're still with me, it, I, you know, feel free to drop off. Uh, happy holidays if you do um, or if you stay. But uh, I'm going to get into embedding real quick. If you have a website and you'd like to see how that's done, uh, I can cover that really briefly, hopefully in three minutes or less. Um, so let's say that I'm on the statistics page. And <clears throat> there's a particular chart that I want to um, that I want to show for Northern Virginia, say. A lot of folks will create entire statistics sections with zip codes that are of interest to their market. Um, but just for example, let's say I want to go to Northern Virginia. And I want to talk about, or you know, put something in about. Uh, I don't know why that's back. Um, oh, now it's gone. I just had to uh, change the view. Um, okay, so I want to just talk about. Wow, look at the look at inventory. It's not as that as it's not as high as it once was. So I can take this chart, and let's say I want to do a line view. And however I have it, I could turn on townhouses or detached homes or whatever it is. Um, but let's say that I just want to compare attached versus detached over time. Not, I'm not saying this is a good chart to use, but just to give you an example. However, whatever placement my chart last is in, um, whatever configuration I have, if I click the, I can download as an Excel sheet uh, where I'll get the actual stats. I can download an image of this, which is good if you're wanting to share in emails um, or to save into a PowerPoint you're putting together, what have you. Um, iframes obviously don't work there. But I have the embed option as well. So if I click embed, actually, I'm sorry, I, I know I'm jumping all over. Before I get into embed, share is just a simple thing. So I could also share this. If I wanted to share it in an email, have my customers see the interactive view. Um, I can share it, and it's just basically a web page that they can then open up from their email and interact with it. It's not going to be on my website. It's on a on a page that non RBI customers, non Smart Charts customers can access. So that's a quick way to share a chart, uh, an email, or on Twitter, Facebook, what have you. Embedding is pretty quick as well, as long as you have a website that has CMS that you're comfortable with. Um, I choose my embed type. So if I want this to be stuck in uh, November of 2014 for all duration, um, then I'd click fixed date range version. All that means is that my chart is never going to update past November of 2014. Uh, if I have an evergreen place on my website, a statistics section or whatever it might be, um, then I'll do the auto update version so that on the 10th of the month, uh, when new stats come into our site, my your website is updated, and your customers will be able to see that, and you can point them to, hey, look at my website. I've got all these updated charts and graphs. I pick my size. If I have a right rail, say, on my site, then I can go with the smaller size. 
all the way up to a 785 by 440. These are pretty much web standard sizes, so hopefully there's one that will fit whatever design placement you're thinking of. Once I've got the chart in, uh, in, in the shape I want it to be, I just copy this. I can either hit Control C or just right click and say copy. And then I go into my admin panel. So this is a, just an example uh, sample site. Uh, it's an exact site thing we do just for demoing. So this is what my page looks like for South Riding. Um, this is pretty standard. You'll have a what you see is what you get kind of thing, a WYSIWYG, which is design. Um, exact site calls it the design view. Um, let's say that I'm going to put this chart down here, and I'm not that comfortable with H HTML, so, man, how am I going to find this thing on the next step? I just randomly put, put chart here so I know where to look. Then I switch over to it. It'll either be source code or it'll be HTML um, view. Uh, different CMSs call it different things, but it's basically the HTML view of what I've put in before. So here I can see all the tags and everything like that. Wow, I, it's, that looks complicated. But I've got my put chart here thing, and I maybe I've put some language around whatever this chart's going to be. And then it's just a matter of, I've already copied that embed code. I just simply paste it, either right-click and paste, or just hit Control-V if you're on a um, laptop, not a Mac. Um, and then go back to my design view. And voila, I've got my chart. I can publish it from here, or whatever you call it. I can preview it. Let's say that I'm publishing it. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Do you wish to publish this content? Yes, I do. I think it's a great chart. So then I publish it, and now I want to go back to my page. Remember, before I didn't have anything having to do with this chart. Uh-oh. What's going on? Market trends in South Riding. Was that message something that... Yeah, it's there. Come on, exact site. Ah, there we go. So now I've got a chart. So, you know, go look at some of the, we have some customer examples. Um, you can see how other RBI Smart Charts users have used, um, have embedded charts on their websites. Um, you know, feel free to email me again. My name is Corey at RB, my name is Corey Hart. I am available at Corey at RBintel.com, and I will uh, look to answer any questions you might send my way. Uh, thanks again for joining me. I apologize for all the hiccups we encountered, and I um, hope you all have great holidays. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.